In this episode, you'll learn how you can elevate the conversations that you are having from opinion-based to principle-based and thereby make better decisions faster. And the best of all is that you can do this by leveraging an existing tool in your design toolkit. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi everyone, this is Wolfie and welcome to episode number 155 on the Service Design Show. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make all the difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Wolfram Thurm. Head of Design Ops at Gojek, a company which is serving over 170 million users in Southeast Asia. In my conversations with service design professionals, I often hear that they feel like they have to defend their decisions all the time and even sometimes themselves. That no matter which arguments they bring forward, sales and IT always win the conversation in the end and that the organization prioritizes to be human-centered only when there is time, which, let's be honest, there rarely is. Well, if you recognize some of these challenges, make sure you stick around for this episode because Wolfram is going to share how they were able to successfully mitigate some of these challenges by developing a set of company-wide design principles. At the end of this episode, you'll know exactly what the key benefits are of having these design principles, how you can make sure that they don't become just another poster on the wall with the five commandments, which nobody looks at, and where you can start if you want to develop your own set of design principles. If you enjoy conversations like this, which sometimes are on the fringes of service design, but help you to grow as a service design professional, make sure to click the subscribe button and the bell icon because we bring a new video like this every week or so. That about wraps it up for the introduction. And now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Wolfram Thurm. Welcome to the show, Wolfie. Hi, Mark. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, excited to have you on. Uh, I don't think I've had anyone on the show whose name is Wolfie or Wolfram, which I also find a very uh, inspiring name. Um, maybe you can share a little bit about that as well. Uh, but first, uh, the first thing I always ask on the show is for a brief introduction for the people who haven't looked you up yet on LinkedIn. Who are you and what do you do these days? Um, all right. Yeah. So I'm Wolfi uh, from Germany, but living in Bali uh, in Indonesia. After spending the last nine years almost in India, I've uh, relocated here. I am the head of design operations at Gojek, which is like an on-demand platform operating in a couple of Southeast Asian countries, um, uh, solving a lot of customer problems like food delivery, um, mobility, logistics, two-wheeler, four-wheeler taxi services, grocery delivery, and all these kind of things. Mm. And yeah, I'm heading a small team and um, yeah, trying to elevate uh, the craft and how design works at our company. Cool. So uh, I heard you say design ops, and that's one of the reasons why we got in touch. And I heard you say uh, something about Gojek, which is quite interesting because it was a company that I didn't know anything about. And this just shows uh, how. Um, in a in a what kind of bubble we live? Because can you share a little bit about Gojek? Because when you told me like how big it is and what the impact is, I was like, oh man, I'm so ob oblivious and ignorant to some of the things that are happening uh, outside of I don't know my my direct peripheral vision. No, absolutely. No, I'm glad to. Um, I'm happy to. Um... I, I love what we do, so I, I love to talk about this. To be honest, also because I'm a strong believer in what we do. It's it's a social impact first kind of company, but with a very massive impact and at a massive scale in Southeast Asia. So Gojek, as I mentioned, right, is an on-demand platform. We do uh, logistics, mobility, food delivery, grocery delivery. We have two sister companies, uh, one for financial services and one for uh, e-commerce uh, that uh, came into being after a merger about a year ago. And we've gone public as a company a couple of months ago. 
so it's an exciting time for us also. But yeah, we are, we are quite large, actually. So um, there are more than two and a half million people livelihood that actually depends on us in terms of our driver partners and merchant partners. Um, our company alone contributes more than, I think, to two and a half percent of the entire GDP of Indonesia. So that kind of scale is is massive. And as far as I know, quite unheard of uh, uh, for Western companies. And so it's a very meaningful uh, job because it actually touches millions of people every day. In terms of our end consumers, of course, we have hundreds of millions. Um, but uh, in terms of people actually depending on us, there are still like millions of them. So that is that is quite meaningful. Yeah, and it's it's uh, again, it's insane, and it's obvious that there are these companies out there which you don't know anything about, and that have uh, such such a huge impact. Um, yeah, uh, I'd love to hear more about that in this uh, conversation. Before we dive into that, uh, there is a 60 second, nowadays maybe 90 second lightning round, five questions, which uh, uh, you have the goal of answering as quickly and as briefly as possible so that we get to know you a little bit better as a person next to the professional. So five questions uh, for you. Are you ready? All right, <laughs> let's, do, let's do it. <laughs> All right. What was your first job? I was a tailor. Uh, in a clothing store doing custom clothes uh, for men and women. Um, that was actually my first job. But to be honest, my real professional first job was a musician. My professional background is music. I used to be a musician, Western classically trained. I play the French horn and that was my, my main profession. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I like how uh, design attracts people from uh, many different disciplines. Um, sure. Now the next, <laughs> next question. Uh, is uh, again very personal if you could be an animal which kind of animal would you like to be okay easy answer a cat but uh, i need to specify a cat in istanbul because i think if you're a cat in istanbul that's when you really made it in life what, what happens when you're a cat in istanbul they are incredibly well looked after in istanbul it's this whole cultural concept of looking after street animals and every single cat there has a fantastic life awesome uh we'll note that one Next question is about books. Um, if you could just recommend one book to someone, which book would you recommend? Fiction or nonfiction? Let's do nonfiction. Nonfiction. One book I always love to recommend is um, it's called uh, Creative Confidence. A beautiful book about like design thinking in general. Very foundational, short book. Amazing. Uh, I can second that recommendation as well. Um, next question is, uh, you're in Bali, so I'm really curious to this question. Uh, what's always in your fridge? To be honest, like we have the saying, if you can see the back of the fridge, it's considered empty. <laughs> so there, there are a lot of things. Uh, I love my bread for breakfast, so there will be always bread and some cheese, uh, some peanut butter, um, jelly. But most likely, you will also find beer, tonic water, and some booze. <laughs> All right. Uh, and the fifth and final question is about service design. And uh, I know you're in the design ops space, but I'm still curious if you recall a moment when you first heard about service design. To be honest, I think that was during college, actually, like uh, studying design is when we first heard about it. But I had literally like no idea what it was. And that stayed the, the way for many years to come. And only now more and more I'm starting to understand like the nuances and complexities of it. Cool. Now let's uh, transition into the topic of today. And I was reading through your notes and I came up with a sort of the summary uh, or the pitch for this episode. Uh, and that is how to make better decisions faster. <laughs> that's, yeah. th that's the promise that you need to deliver up on <laughs> in the next, uh, in the next 45 minutes. So um, we're going to talk about a topic called design principles, which is something that I assume will be familiar to many listeners. Design principles are a cornerstone of the design process. At least I think so. And I've used them uh, a lot uh, in my days when I was uh, a service design practitioner. I'm um, curious to your uh, maybe quote unquote definition of design principles. What are they to you? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, 
Yes, I, 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 I agree with you. Design principles are being widely used. Um, they are first principles that we use. There are great books written on design principles, like uh, the, the, the shape of design, uh, the laws of simplicity. Um, uh, however, for us, design principles were really like a tool that we needed to develop in order to improve the way we have design conversations, design critiques, uh, the way we prioritize uh, work. So. Uh, when we speak about design principles, we don't exclusively look uh, on look at, at what we work on, but also like how we work on those things. Um, for us, design principles were a necessity that was born out of the experience of not being able to really get our points across in the way we would like to. And so we needed to really kind of improve the kind of ammunition that we have in conversations, whether it's uh, a design critique or prioritization session or like an iteration planning meeting, or even just simple documentation, like documenting like design specs, etc. Okay, so uh, you already hinted upon a lot of things uh, we'll uh, explore. Uh, but before we um, dive into all the details, you have a set of design principles set up a set of uh, internal design principles. Um, as a team for the organization, and you already uh, sort of hinted upon why and what the challenges are, which challenges they uh, needed to address. I want to go back in time, as I usually do at the start of the conversation, and that is to understand how did you, as a design ops team, as a design op lead, uh, arrive at the point where you thought, okay, we need something, and that something might be design principles. Can you share a little bit about the journey, how you got to realizing this? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think one indicator was, and that actually predates my joining Gojek even, but one, indi one strong indicator that, that we had was that we kept having the same kind of arguments again and again, and maybe also that mistakes were repeated again and again, that we might have been failing to make our point again and again. And as soon as we realized there's a pattern here, um, we saw the opportunity that a principled approach might actually help that. Of course, as for any design project, it's kind of hypothesis driven that we assumed that principles will actually help us to elevate the kind of conversations from what we felt was a lot of opinion-based conversations to like principled ones, but that was the foundation or the, the breeding ground, uh, so to say, for developing design principles. Long Let's, story short, yeah, a lot yeah. of things went wrong, right? A lot of things went wrong uh, or like went not ideal in conversations and we felt that design principles will give us the leverage to change that. Hmm. Let's let's double click on these terms. Uh, uh, you introduced opinion-based conversations, principle-based conversations. Uh, could you color that a bit with some examples? So, what what were some of the common? What kind of conversations might somebody recognize as being opinion-based? Like, if I'm a service designer, I, maybe UI, UX designer, like, what yeah. are these situations that I find myself in where I could recognize, ah, oh, okay, so this this is what Wolfie is meaning. Well, I think for anybody who works in product development, especially, especially digital product development, there are countless uh, conversations where you find yourself confronted with a person's opinion that weighs more than your argument just because that person might have a higher position in the organization. I know there's this acronym, I think we call them HIPPOS, the highest highest paid, paid person's opinion. Um, and that can be very frustrating if you actually, you might even have data to support your insights or um, you might even have like, like very good um, like research data, uh, could be customer data, could be any kind of thing. And you actually um, try to convince a person to prioritize a feature that would notably increase customer experience. And you get challenged with a simple, I don't think that's going to work. If you remain in that realm of opinion-based conversation, it's going to be very hard uh, it's going to be very hard to actually convince the other person to change their opinion if we actually believe that opinions in a situation like this matters, when in fact they shouldn't matter. And uh, this this uh, this is like a super frustrating process because you sort of have some evidence or something that uh, points you in a certain direction and uh, you encounter um, objections or uh, 
critiques or, well, uh, you don't get the support that you would expect based on the quote unquote evidence that you present, right? That's, that's sort of what's yeah. going on. But it's, it's, it's a limited perspective here, right? Because we are looking at the clashing of opinions. And the idea of principles is really an idea of elevation, of elevating the conversation to no longer be opinion-based, but actually about principles that both agreed on. Um, let me give you an example of, of one of the most beautiful principles that is most closest to my heart. It's called what's good for the customer is good for the business. It's kind of obvious. Everybody knows this. Customer customer centricity is good. Customer centricity is great, etc. But a lot of people are still stuck in this narrative of design versus business, where they're saying that you have to balance business goals and customer needs. Obviously, you have to balance those. And obviously, there is a bit of a dependency. But one has to understand that this dependency, for example, is not neutral. Um, you can say what's good for the customer is good for business success. What's good for the customer is good for the business, right? Because you know that customer centricity will ultimately lead to business success. But you can't really say it the other way around, that something is good for the customer because it's good for the business. So it's understanding these nuances of what is the actual goal behind balancing customer goals and business needs. If you actually understand and agree on what the larger um, objective is, and that goes uh, much beyond a difference of, in opinions. It actually means like you are aligned on the larger uh, objective and the vision of it. You immediately elevate the conversation from something about opinions to something about principles. And it's much easier to take a decision uh, based on that principles, which kind of like circles back to your to the to the very high bar we set of making faster and better decisions. So um, when I was thinking about this, like uh, I, and I. I'm going to ask you to explain and share with us uh, how this journey of coming up with these principles happened. But sort of the feeling of our company values uh, came came up on me, like seeing those posters with the five company values, and then we all adhere to them. Like we did a offsite session two days. Like I'm exaggerating here, but um, I'm curious, like. How how do you now? There's so many questions <laughs> popping up in my head, but um, how do you make sure that people actually live these mm -hmm. principles? Yeah, that's a tough one, right? Because it's very easy to come up with amazing projects, and I don't know how many millions of amazing documents just lie around in corporate shared drives, and nobody cares about them. Uh, adoption is is always like key, and um, we can yeah. Let's talk about the adoption or bringing it to life first before we go into like the origin story of it, perhaps. So, to me, um, there are multiple layers when it comes to evangelism. I think there is uh, largely, and that is basically just talking from my own experience, and I might be wrong about this, but I'm just sharing kind of like what 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 we've learned along the way. Um, I see three layers to evangelism. There is one leadership layer, which is mostly purely about education and broadcasting, right? You might talk about this in a company all hands. You might talk about this in like large meetings where you just introduce it as a concept and educate people about the existence. The second layer for me is on a group or team layer. And that evangelism is much more critical. It builds on top of the educational foundation. And again, that uh, that team or group player, for example, for us happens uh, as a workshop. And again, there we have to look at not only educating people, not only sort of like um, explaining the concept, but also applying the concept, also reflecting on the concept. Again, that, that second layer of, of team of conducting workshops uh, for me has is, is very, very critical and it has to transcend pure education. It has to become interactive and it has to become memorable. And beyond this, that you can actually reflect on it also. So for us, for example, we conducted workshops where we A, understood the principles, B, applied principles in situations that we face today, and C, we actually reflected on past uh, situations in which those principles could have actually helped us to make better or faster decisions. And that Trinity actually helped us to um, get a much higher adoption. And the third layer of evangelism is one-on-one, -on -one, right? It's relentless persuasion of a lot of people and keep talking about it, keep bringing it up and making sure that everybody actually knows that. And the most effective way to do this is you have to find the right kind of allies. We have to find those um, those people who have a lot of uh, gravitational pull 
and if they become your allies, they will become um, our own brand ambassadors for the principles itself. So that is one part of it, right? That's the evangelism part of it. The second part I feel is also about uh, tracking. Um, there needs to be some sort of like feedback of like how we, how well we're actually doing. And that again, it's hard, like how are you gonna like measure whether somebody has or has not uh, used principles? So we had a bit of a lucky coincidence there, I would say, um, because we actually planned to develop like physical a physical set of cards with our design principles that people could carry around in their pockets. And if you have you, know, you find yourself in a meeting room in a heated conversation, you can slam the card on the table and saying like, hey, this is a principle violation. And then while we were preparing for this, COVID came and we had no longer an office to go to, uh, which kind of was a shock for all of us. Um, and that's a whole different topic to begin with uh, in itself. But for us, that meant these physical cards were no longer viable and we actually um, created digital cards. Now, our, all of our um, company conversation happens on Slack, uh, including like critiques and feedback and questions and Q&A sessions are being conducted on Slack. So we developed like a custom Slack app in which we can actually use those principles. And so instead of slamming them on the table, you slam these principle cards now into Slack conversations. And it's not quite the same, but it gives us the advantage that we can actually measure how they're being used, in which circumstances, by whom, how many times we can actually get data on like what are the most important uh, principles that are uh, most uh, used most often. Um, and, and we can actually get data on that. So that's quite quite powerful in order to validate whether those principles actually have any impact or not. That's uh, that's super interesting. And I can uh, I can see how that helps to sort of uh, steer and iterate and, and prototype new ideas around this. When, uh, when you're sharing this, I'm sort of hearing that adoption is pretty successful, or at least it's, it's more successful than in many other examples that I've heard. Um, the thing I was curious about is this, um, the problem that it solves initially feels like it's the problem of the design professional. Like they feel that they aren't being heard or the company isn't listening to them. So th there's a clear benefit for the design professional to have something like these principles. Why would the organization or the rest of the organization also ad uh, adopt these? Because for the other people inside the organization, it might be like, come on, just stop complaining, uh, do your work. <laughs> and um, what's what's in it for them? How did you pitch that? How did you get them to uh, also get on this journey? Yeah, okay. So I think um, I have to be honest with you too, right? This um, I don't mean to over-idealize this. Um, to make to keep these principles alive, it uh, takes a lot of work and and dedication and and like at least a person needs to actually like constantly be on top of that, which is also I think why in the last cycle in the last six months perhaps the the usage and adoption has actually declined, um, but we have the right tools to intervene again to like bring this up. So I'm not too concerned about this. But when it comes to like, yeah, why would anybody agree to them? Obviously, like a designer can just come up and say like, yeah, good UX is the most important thing in the world. And I might say like, you might think that, but I don't. So that that uh, brings us a little bit to the um, to the uh, making of the principles, right? And what I think what you are referring to is this like last 10% of it, which is obviously like 90% of the work. And that was actually getting everybody on board. And that meant negotiating, negotiating, negotiating. You actually had to find this common ground that not only your product or research or engineering counterparts would also believe in, who are naturally like easier to convince, but also your business counterparts, which was uh, much harder. But um, we kind of went through that exercise again and again, like meeting with them, aligning with them, making sure they're on the same page, that this is something they agree to. Because we knew unless they agree to this, unless they believe in the same principle, for example, what's good for the customer, what's good for the business, uh, only if they believe in that as much as we do, we can actually use this as a principle. But that whole concept, I mean, that whole negotiation is part of what principles are about. It's about elevating and trying to identify what is this like underlying objective what is the actual objective of the of the 
uh, company. And if you call yourself customer-centric or design-led, right, it's very easy to call yourself this. It's very, it's much, much harder to actually put this into action. But if you truly want to be like a customer-centric company, if customer centricity is one of the core principles for your uh, for your product development, then you gotta agree to some of these things, and that is the route that we also took. This this sounds like a super strategic initiative. Uh, this <clears throat> uh, it feels like if this starts bottom up, it won't have any chance to succeed. Um, you won't find adoption outside of maybe your team or department. Um, how how did that go well, in your situation? To be honest, uh, Gojek is is a fairly bottom up in terms of how we run things. Uh, if a large scale initiative is to survive, it has to be a bottom up initiative because that's where you know the groundwork has been taken. It's it's much more often in my experience that top down things fail than like uh, bottom up things that had the resilience to like push through. Um, how how do I phrase this? Like. We had an advantage in Gojek, uh, and that is that we had a wealth of experience how things went wrong in our past. We didn't start the exercise of building principles from 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 zero. We actually started with a wealth of uh, I call them let's say micro case studies of uh, instances where principles could have helped reach a better outcome for our customers as well as for the business. So. This becomes a very strong leverage in a conversation like this. And I've I've had conversations with other designers professionals who want to introduce principals who are starting this uh, from zero, who don't have that wealth of experiences, how things can go wrong and how principals could have helped. And I feel um, that worked in our favor in that negotiation to convince business stakeholders to also buy in. Yeah, because you, you can make a business case, uh, right? Yes, I mean, Maybe not, I would not go beyond. A, yeah. yeah, I would not only call it a business case, but you can make a quantifiable case. Okay. And I, th I think customer centricity is not only about its translation into dollar values. It has to be more than that. Otherwise, it's just um, kind of fake. And if, if if the company actually believes this, then it's more about quantification and the quality of your argument rather than translating everything into a direct business value, I, I would say. Yeah, and then in my perspective, a business case is more than uh, numbers value, but at least you can make a case <laughs> based on yeah, uh, no, absolutely, yeah, uh, based on the failures and whether it's uh, increased revenue or it's increased employer employee happiness or customer satisfaction. Like you can find argument. That's it. You can find arguments uh, that help you to make to say why this is important, why we should align on uh, on this, right? Absolutely. Though I also have to be honest, I feel that um, Gojek has been customer centric always. So I feel that the battle that we are fighting is an easier one as compared to some of the other stories that I've been exposed to. Right? Like um, something as simple as um, what's good for the customer is good for the business. It doesn't take much to convince a business stakeholder that this is a good principle to follow. It's not that, it's not that case in the vast majority of companies today, unfortunately. And uh, with like with that, I think you'll find a saying like that in many, I don't know, uh, company values or uh, and norms, statements, company missions. Uh, the, the, the tricky thing seems to me like, uh, again, how do you actually live by this? Because when, um, uh, when the heat is up uh, and often, uh, I don't know. Middle management has to make short-term decisions. These are some th these principles often become nice to have rather than actual mm -hmm. principles. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, it's a fair point. I think there are two parts uh, to the answer to this. One is to understand like what principles actually are and like how they apply uh, in in our case. The other one is also like at what point in your product development lifecycle do you introduce them. So maybe I want to start with this one. I feel uh, what we've been trying to do is that when you actually start at inception itself or kickoff or whatever you call this uh, initial stage of scoping and planning, if you actually use this stage to talk about, hey, what are the principles that we want to uh, set here that will guide the decision making in this project? 
And they don't even have to be our design principle. They could be any kind of principles, as long as they're not conflicting with each other. That's fine. Because obviously, like, our design principles are not, um, they're not all-encompassing, right? There might be specifics that you want to add to a specific project. If you can actually manage to have this conversation early on, it's much easier to use the principles as a fallback, even if things get hot. The other thing is like how these principles actually apply, right? So when we arrived at the set of our principles, it's largely, and we can talk about this a little more in detail later also, but it's largely like multiple rounds of affinity mapping that actually like lead to understanding what are the kind of like themes uh, that emerge and what are the kind of principles that would apply to those kind of themes. And um, we had multiple models run. Should we arrange or sort the principles by a timeline, um, like when they appear in the product development lifecycle? Should we arrange them by stakeholders? Should we arrange them by what we're working on versus how we're working on the things? There are like many models that one can apply. For us, we, de uh, we developed an in-between version that felt right for us. So we have a combination of uh, what we work on and how we work on. But in reality, the way the principles apply, they don't make the decisions for us, right? Uh, they are ammunition to make the decisions. And while the principles are not conflicting, they can actually be perceived that way. To give you an example, one of the principles that we have is explore all possible solutions. Very design-focused, iteration-focused principle that you make sure that you really go broad and that you don't buy in your first idea. Another principle is called launch to learn which means ultimately in order to learn anything, you have to actually launch it. And so while one principle talks about the exploration and spending more time in going broad, the other one says you have to actually launch it in order to learn anything. So you could say that those are conflicting. However, the way, the way we look at principles, it's not that those principles will make any decisions for you. You use those principles to take a decision. And uh, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> I, I get that, and uh, uh, the, um, it's it's uh, it becomes an art, like finding knowing how to balance and nuance and prioritize these principles. Um, I, I would love to hear a, a bit more about what other principles you also have, and maybe which ones you've scratched or didn't make the cut. But um, in my head, I'm sort of trying to summarize this already, and. Um, from the limited knowledge that I have of architecture, like they, uh, before they start making anything, there is like uh, a brief that says something about probably uh, sustainability these days and which materials mm -hmm. should be used and like uh, specifications that the eventual construction need, needs to adhere to. Like I can imagine that these design principles uh, have the same role, but are more focused on the human factors in this case, or maybe even uh, on the design process. And uh, sorry, it's true. Yeah, one, one more thing to add there. Um, the reason I'm uh, saying this is you mentioned that it helps uh, thinking when in the process they apply. I think it's super cri critical, like you said, that when you have the opportunity to introduce them in the inception stage, that it becomes so much easier to actually use them, live by them, um, compared to when you want to introduce them in something that's already running. So this isn't really a question, but a long observation. No, I mean, I mean, you're spot on. For us, it's a bit of a combination of both, right? As I said, it's about what we work on. So it can be leveraged for prioritization. And it's also like how we work, where it's more leveraged during the process. In fact, I mean, we have principles being used in research reports, right? If our research team comes back with a detailed report and a list of recommendations, they actually use those principles to substantiate their claims, which is kind of a powerful application also. Maybe it, it, it's, it becomes more... Alive, if I can also talk about what those principles actually are for us. So it's it's a total set of 16 principles, um, which is a kind of large number. So in all honesty, it's also our version one. We hope that eventually we can actually do a version two. That might be the 10 commandments or something like that. But 16 was the number that felt right for us because it's a it's basically like four groups of four. And we call those four groups the four eyes. Uh, because there are four principles for impactful design, there are four principles for inclusive design, four principles for intuitive design, and four principles for iterative design. 
And when we look, for example, at the first pillar, the impactful uh, design, it's um, not all of them are about process, right? For example, start with the problem, not the solution. This one might be um, process focused, and it's a very well known uh, principle that you shouldn't jump to solutions, but you have to really fully understand the problem first. It not only talks about process, it also talks about the quality of problem definition in itself, right? Do we really understand the problem well enough to, to move on? Another one, for example, though, is like know what create looks like and know all your constraints to ship. So know what create looks like means do you actually have like any kind of data? Um, do you have any kind of metrics to understand what your success actually looks like? What will failure look like? Do you actually know when you have succeeded or not? It's, it's, it's kind of shocking to see that many projects that I've seen in other companies as well actually are not clear about uh, defining when have we succeeded and when have we failed. And constraints, right? Constraints is not only feasibility. It's not only mean, it doesn't mean only to talk to your engineering partners early on to say like, hey, can we actually build this? It's also understanding like external constraints, cultural constraints, political constraints, all of these kind of things. So those principles are not only focused on the process and how we actually do product development, but really about like, what are the kind of issues that we really need to work on? And, and yeah, how do we approach that? Can I ask a question about this? Um, what I see with uh, uh, with statements like this is uh, that they leave a lot of room for interpretation, uh, which is good. The, they feel subjective, and again, that that might be good. But if you want to um, move away from opinions and more to principles. Uh, people need to have some sort of shared vision what this actually means. So uh, yeah. yeah, the examples that you gave, uh, what does good look like or what does success look like? I, I'm, I'm curious if you're doing something to make that even more specific, uh, maybe provide mm -hmm. cases or case studies like, yeah. this is what we mean when we say this. No, absolutely. And, and thank you for bringing this up because yes, the principles are meant to be not generic, but in a way open-ended because they can't be instructive, right? They can't be um, that one-dimensional. So the way they actually manifest in reality, um, and that's part of our adoption strategy itself, is we actually have a wealth of case studies um, supporting each of those principles. There's literally like 20, 30 case studies sometimes supporting, and these are all examples from our own past of where this principle was followed or uh, broken. And, and how the principle could have or did impact the outcome of that particular situation. So there's actually like a long, long list of, um, yeah, we call them micro case studies because we don't want this to be like heavy documentation. They're literally like one paragraph, like two sentences long examples. But each of those principles has a long list of those. So it's kind of easy to understand how they manifest in reality. And I think you need that kind of um, evidence uh, to to ground these principles. Uh, otherwise, uh, I can see that people will really quickly <laughs> turn this into, well, this is just your opinion. Like, this is just what you find important. But uh, you, if you have um, examples where things didn't work out or did work out because you did or didn't follow, a certain principle this uh, moves it away from this is what i think to this is what happened and i just made an observation and this is absolutely so it's both right on the one hand it is uh, a instructive uh, in a way that you can understand how these principles manifest and the other way this itself is a very big part of the argumentation to convince business stakeholders that those are the right kind of principles and by evangelizing them, we actually increase our ammunition and leverage to substantiate why they are the right principles. Because through these kind of workshops that we conduct, we actually gain more and more wealth of case studies and examples of how those principles could have helped. In fact, we also get data on what other principles um, uh, could be there, or what principles we might be missing, etc. But essentially, this is like a growing, uh, a growing library of, of, um, of data. You mentioned the workshop already a few times. Like, can you share uh, a bit more about that? Like, who's doing the workshop? 
who is going through the workshop what do you do in these workshops like because that sounds like a critical element in this entire process <laughs> no i i i I very, very much think it is. Uh, I, I completely agree with you. I, I want to circle back to these like three layers of evangelism, um, uh, also three layers of education, um, because a workshop in itself, right, it, it doesn't do anything. Like, unless you can actually generate uh, the perception of value in the audience, it's just going to be time spent or, in the worst case, time wasted. So we really had to make sure that those workshops actually lead to action. So we set them up in these three layers. On the, on the one hand, in the first layer, we explain principles, we explained how they came into being, why they are the way they are, what they are, etc. And we run through that with the audience in the workshop. And by audience, I mean, we, conduct, we conducted workshops with smaller groups, I would say, with like product development groups. Let's say a one product vertical uh, is, is in one workshop. So that means between 15 and 30 people, perhaps. So step number one is, of course, the introduction, the educational aspect. Step number two is where it gets really interactive. That's where we actually like have um, have set a whole bunch of, of random examples from our current or recent uh, past of what's going on in Gojek with the task to the audience to actually match the principles to the right kind of scenario. Almost a bit like a quiz, um, but more like an interactive um, exercise. And one aspect that we realized there already is that it's not necessarily that one principle matches to one situation, but mostly when things go right, a lot of principles actually have been followed. And when things go wrong, it's usually the result of picking multiple principles. So this is not like a one-to-one -one exercise, but actually like understanding the whole matrix of how, in, uh, how various principles uh, influence certain decisions. And that's the second part where we actually apply the kind of knowledge. And the third part, which is the reflection part, is where we ask the audience to actually um, come up with their own examples from our past at Gojek. They could even be like examples from their previous companies. We hardly have ever had any of those. But that's where people actually reflect on their own past. And that's why it makes sense to keep the workshops with a specific audience, like one product group, because usually that's shared experience, especially with the more senior people. And that's where we actually get this... Um, really, really interesting stories that we didn't know about that actually are provided by the audience. And this kind of input is a, is a big part in not only understanding how those principles might be viable for you, but actually seeing in your own examples, in your own context on how these principles can actually amplify the kind of impact that you have. So it's the combination of these three layers of education, um, ap education, application, and reflection that I felt is a powerful combination to to that, that that leads to behavioral change yeah at least it hopefully leads to insights and those aha moments and it makes these principles come to life i think that's that's the key that people are able to translate what these things mean in their own practice yeah right yeah, absolutely that, that, yeah absolutely yeah one one um question related to this is it sounds like uh, the initiative to uh, organize these workshops, to come up with these principles, to maintain them, uh, is within your design ops team. Is, is that the case? That is the case, yeah. So the spark for it might come from the design leadership, might come from an insight. We have many, many sources of where we get ideas from. I don't want to any ever claim ownership over an idea. Um, once an idea emerges, um, we execute it. And um, it also speaks of uh, what design ops actually does in many organizations. It's a lot of chasing people down <laughs> and nudging people and reminding people and a lot of evangelism. If, if one of the goals of design ops today, and that's the case for our design ops team, is to actually embed customer centricity into the company's DNA, um, then these kind of workshops can be, again, leveraged to inch closer towards a goal like that. But it, it means that... Um, yeah, the initiative is is on our side. And as everybody would probably agree who works in larger corporations, information just by existing doesn't reach anybody. You have to very, very actively like bring information to people. You can never expect people to just find your information or come to you. So chasing people down, nudging people, reminding people, 
um, sending out reports on usage and adoption on impact stories, etc. Those are all like the tools that we can apply to keep adoption high. And um, is um, increasing adoption of these design principles and making them better, uh, the quality of them better, uh, this is a weird question, but is that on your yearly review? Are you uh, sort of judged by the success of this? So uh, the honest answer is not in this year. Last year we did have this uh, on our OKRs and we had a certain uh, adoption target. Uh, it was a percentage of all designers as well as a percentage of like non-design users that we chased. And we, we reported on it and we, we were accountable for that. Yeah, and absolutely. The, the accountability, that sounds like something that we haven't uh, addressed yet, but it might be the magic ingredient here uh, because um, even though you say you, you don't own this, there is somebody responsible and there is somebody who is accountable for making sure that people are chased down, that this is brought forward in the organization, that uh, these workshops are organized. If <clears throat> uh, the, the, I can assume the big pitfall here would be like, we have design principles and everybody owns them and then nothing happens because everybody owns them. No, absolutely. There has to be ownership and there has to be like accountability. And uh, that was uh, that was my job uh, when I joined was uh, the development and the follow up on this. When I actually took over the team, uh, in all honesty, right, is also when my bandwidth was severely compromised uh, and I could no longer like exclusively focus on some of these uh, projects because my role changed right from being executional to being much more managerial and um that's the issue that we face today like who can take this up because we are post ipo company now our budgets are not as lavish as they used to be right like um things are not as easy anymore but the power of those principles remains and it's very much uh, still there um they are still being used they're, they're still being leveraged but um they could use a boost absolutely um, but because we've kind of have this uh, the setup and we have this kind of toolbox, we know what levels we could pull to to um, speed things up again, to boost adoption again. So imagine uh, you move to a different company, or maybe you get like a re big reset button in, in this current role and they offer you the opportunity to start again. Right. Uh, we need we want design principles because we experience the challenges that you described. What would be some of the things you uh, maybe would do different in the second iteration coming up to these design principles uh, based on the learnings that you gained in the, I don't know, it's past few years, uh, I assume. To be honest, uh, it sounds a little commonsensical, perhaps too commonsensical, but in my reflection, I would probably focus more on less is more because I feel our principles are too um, broad. They cover like too broad of a field and in themselves, they're not um, like for me, the fact that it's both what and how uh, for me is a bit of a, not a problem, but it takes a little bit away of the punch that the principles could have. If, if this would be more clear about like, hey, these principles are how we prioritize. Hey, these principles are how we work. It becomes more applicable. So I feel um, if I were to do this again, and that might, be apply, that might even apply if we do like a version two of those, I feel more focus in the way we structure the principles uh, in itself would help them to become more, more effective. How, how did the structuring occur in version 1.0 version 1.0 uh there's always chaos right so i i i i have to keep this uh, in mind as a, as a as a disclaimer um as i mentioned multiple rounds of affinity ma mapping right but that's an oversimplification so we had the we had like these long, 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 long lists and lot and lot and lot of anecdotal data of things going wrong, repeating patterns, etc. And we are trying to like organize through these, through the uh, exercise of affinity mapping, trying to identify meaningful themes, meaningful buckets, meaningful like clusters of, of principles. And we went through 
many, many iterations. And as I mentioned, right, we can we can base themes on on timelines. We can base themes on stakeholders. We can base themes on on all sorts of things. And it was very unclear for us like what we should do. We could even base themes, and let me just put that out there, also on like cool acronyms, because it should sound like uh, very memorable. Because yeah, principles have to be memorable, right? So um, when the four eyes uh, emerged for us, it also felt like a meaningful mental model that we could apply that makes these principles more memorable, for example. Um, and we kind of ran a lot of uh, feedback rounds, of course, like with the team, with the stakeholders, with our uh, partners in product and research. And yeah, it's the result of that process, of that iterative process that uh, we arrived at this version. Yeah, it sounds like a, a lot like that design process where things emerge. <laughs> Emerge over Things time. emerge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You go broad, you go narrow. You go broad, you go narrow. Um, we always uh, we always do this. It's, it's, it's one learning for design ops itself, right? The projects that we execute or the programs that we run, we run them like design projects. We have a problem space. We have a solution space. Uh, we have diamonds. We have diverging and converging phases. The same logic applies here in the development of the design principles. And yes, there's always like a, a, a spoonful of chaos and unpredictability involved as well. But that is what design is all about. And yeah, that's kind of what happened to us. You, you. Let me ask you another question about the the process getting to this. Uh, as we're now sort of reflecting on that, you mentioned the ninety ten rule. I'm going to go for the eighty twenty rule. Um, if you look at um, the activities that you undertook over the past few years, there there are always a few activities which sort of give you the most impact. What do you feel? have been the is the 20 percent of activities that gave you the biggest benefit the, the most value in this entire process um that's a tough question i i feel that actually we spend a lot of time and effort at the very very specific wording and phrasing of the principles together with our ux writers and writing professionals uh, which is an amazing experience for me as a UX professional to actually understand like the power of 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 writing and writing professionals and the kind of value that they can actually add. But we would literally like spend hours debating over very specific words. Um, just not only do they really convey precisely what we want the principles to uh, convey, but also are they worded in a, a positive or engaging way? Like are they all following like a similar pattern, etc. So. There's a lot of nuance to be to be considered. So that that part actually helped us a lot. And actually, I, I, I feel even though it was a lot of time that we uh, invested, the effort was worth it because creating that punch behind a principle is really, really critical for it to be effective. The other thing though I want to mention is the countless debates and negotiations with our partners about those. Because without them, as you mentioned earlier, the principles would be meaningless because they would be just designs. They wouldn't actually be carried forward by our partners in research or in product or in engineering or in business even. And these negotiations were tedious. And again, a lot of follow-up, a lot of chasing people, making sure people actually read them, give their feedback, understand them, etc. But again, I feel this was really, really important. I saw a couple of other initiatives similarly that didn't spend as much time in doing that. And there is a significant difference in the way they are adopted. Yeah, uh, I'm happy that you mentioned this because uh, my question tries to evoke like maybe uh, uh, quick wins, fast wins, easy, <laughs> the easy process. But um, th the good thing maybe here is that it's not easy. Like it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. You have to go through, you have to go through this um, to get to a meaningful result there isn't it sounds maybe there is but we haven't discovered it yet it doesn't sound like there is a 20 percent you can only focus on like you need to focus on the 80 percent as the other 80 percent as well you absolutely have to i i completely agree and and if you see the 16 principles today they all are very obvious they all sound very commonsensical but it's the hard work that actually made them appear very commonsensical and obvious uh, and I feel 100% it's worth it. 
Though I also have to agree that um, everything needs to have a timeline. If you can't just like explore endlessly. And especially as designers, we need to remind ourselves sometimes of this, right? But um, here, yeah, all those uh, effort that kind of happens behind the scenes that you can't really see at all behind the end result definitely made a big difference. Yeah, and it's not just, of course, these 16 principles that you have. It's like all the conversations that happened to get there, right? The, the Sometimes I see these principles and many other artifacts within our field as uh, an excuse to have meaningful conversations. Uh, it helps to, to say we're working on principles and therefore we need to have this conversation together. We need to align on, on this topic. Yeah. And that's that's yeah, that's agree. not that's not even um uh a side benefit. That's maybe and then I'm sort of getting on your seat, that's maybe the biggest benefit that these conversations have happened. It there is a strategic component to it, right? Like how do you establish uh how do you position design in general in the organization? And obviously these conversations play a part. Like obviously running initiatives like this, uh, along with a lot of other initiatives that that my team runs, um these are not only there's always a secondary benefit of how this actually contributes to the role design plays overall in the organization as well. Yes, and design principle conversations are very, very critical to understand like, hey, what are kind of what what is the kind of role that we actually play? So somebody is listening to this episode and they are literally pulling their hair out because they've just come out of a meeting where they met a hippo and they weren't able to get their points across. Um, and this wasn't the first time. So now they are super inspired by your example of using design principles. What would you say to them? Like, where do you start to, where do you start this process? Yeah, I mean, for us, it was introspection, honest introspection of where things could have been better and understanding the patterns that emerged there. And I think that is a good starting point uh, because if you start with zero experience of how things go wrong, there's a it's it's pure chance whether your principles that you develop are meaningful or not. You can there there are a million of principles. Uh, there are like websites, there are books written about all of them are important. All of them are wonderfully phrased and and all of them have examples, but do they actually mean anything for your specific product development? That that's that that remains to be seen. I think um, it makes sense if the emergence of principles is based on real examples and real experience, and that's where they become powerful. And I think that is the starting point. And then once you have those examples, so you do an introspection, maybe alone or with a few of your team members, you see all those uh, cases where things could have gone better like what's step two then you start building principles right so that would be i mean if you talk about double diamonds right that would be the the divergent uh, aspect of it right the gathering of data and then we we converge we, we actually start to like narrow it down um just to circle back to this point right i i do believe that this has to be like a community driven uh, approach uh, if you start if you do this in isolation again like a like a top down um enforced principle might not be as powerful as a principle that has been developed collectively and has actually carried forward and believed in by all. And in order to do that, you have to also like let go of a lot of this um, decision-making power. You actually have to uh, distribute decision-making power to where the information is. The information, the experience is done by the people on the ground solving actual customer problems, usually not by the managers, right? They're the ones who face the issues in, in reviews in fighting with their product manager counterparts or engineer counterparts or whatever it is. Um, they are the ones who actually make the experience. They're the ones who should be involved in, in deciding on what those principles should be. I, this is a Simon Sinek uh, a, a concept, which I believe he calls distributing decision making power to where the information is. I think that's what, what he calls it in his book, Leaders Eat Last, which is, again, like probably one of those books I would recommend. Um, but this is a very powerful thing to do because not only are you ensuring that the information you work with to develop your principles is actually first-hand experience and not watered down through like uh, shiny whispers, it also means that when you actually do develop those principles and apply them, you have your brand ambassadors built in the system because they're the ones who are invested into changing the status quo. They're the ones who actually have the problem, solve the problem. 
So it is uh, this this kind of bottom up thinking for principles. I think is, is is very essential for it to be actually something that is carried by all and not just enforced by a few. One question that I have about this, and then we'll sort of start wrapping up this episode. The stage between um, introspection and reflection and seeing like the failures and then uh, defining or designing the design principles is like, was there a stage for you where you needed to go to leadership to get permission to actually go into the organization and run this? Um, I don't think so. I'm a strong believer in ask for forgiveness, not for permission. So I, large corporations tend to be very, they by nature become more bureaucratic. And if you actually believe in a bias for action, then <laughs> you have to just get out there and do things and, and yeah, convince through outcomes rather than asking for, for permissions up front. I, I, I never felt that, um, that the workshops itself would be their own success criteria, right? If people would leave those workshops and saying like, that's a waste of my time, then that's a strong indicator that I, I was wrong about my assumptions or my team was wrong about their assumptions. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, getting the feedback from those sessions actually is kind of validation enough uh, even for leadership to see, hey, there's value in this. And I think uh, the reason I'm asking this is um, it has to be part of your job description sort of to have the space to work on this challenge. Like if you're, I don't know, a service designer right now and you're seeing how design principles could be beneficial, but like that's not the thing that you've been hired for, um, that might be a challenge. You need to find somebody in the organization who has responsibility, accountability, ownership of a challenge like this. That I think that that was what I was trying to Okay. No, absolutely. But I, to be honest, I feel this is probably like another whole episode worth of, of stuff when it comes to like, how do you actually justify your existence, right? If we really like go to the root of this question, it's it's about that. Like, how do you, what what are the, what's the kind of narrative that you actually build to justify your existence, to justify the projects and programs you want to run as design ops? And I could imagine that service designers are facing very similar challenges um, where they actually have to kind of quantify what the hell, what the, what value they're actually adding to the business. And that is not an easy thing. And quantification of user experience to begin with is already hard and many people struggle with this. And now if you take it one level up and saying like, how do we quantify internal uh, processes that don't even are uh, directly touching our end consumers, that's an even harder thing to do. But there are many, many metrics that um, one can apply and that we do measure and keep track of. I, I don't want to go too much into the details, but um, obviously, like um, principles can be correlated to a speed of delivery, to velocity. A lot of the programs and projects that we run can can be correlated to engagement, to employee retention, to morale, productivity. Um, and and as as soon as you actually prevent people from leaving your company. That's a, that's a hardcore business metric. And if you talk about speed of delivery, if you talk about, and it's not all about translating what we do into dollar values. Again, it could also be translated into time. It can be translated into all sorts of things. I, This is actually something I could probably <laughs> talk about for like another hour because it's, it's, it's obviously like an issue that, that we also face and something we work on very, very actively. Like how do we actually empower the people in our organization to have more impactful conversations with their counterparts? about like justifying like why a thing they want to do is the right thing to do. That in itself is the topic for many books as well. Um, but yeah, data is everything and being able to substantiate your claims or your your assumptions with any kind of data points, that's the way to go. I, I know that we had that as the alternative topic for our <laughs> conversation today. Let's Let's just agree, we'll do a sequel episode and dive into that data uh, aspect of uh, of our work because I think that will be super beneficial to to your listeners as well. But for now, we really have to sort of start wrapping up. And um, maybe a question that would uh, that would be good for that is if somebody made it all the way till the end till this moment in the conversation, which I applaud them for, uh, and I hope they enjoyed it so far. What is the one thing you hope that they will remember from this chat? Great question. Um, 
to me, it's the idea of when we talk about elevation of conversation, we are not only talking about making our counterpart understand what we want. It's also about us actually elevating ourselves up to that level above and really starting to look at the people we need to agree with, not as our opponents, but our allies, and actually find that common ground. Whenever I see there is a conflict uh, in a professional setting, there is almost always just a conflict on that layer. The moment you level up, the moment you uh, zoom out and become strategic and talk about what are the common goals, the moment you, you align on that, uh, it's a completely different conversation and you become very powerful thought partners to your uh, product and business counterparts rather than they're like a peg in the wheel. And, and principles can, can help. They can be a tool. They can be ammunition to do that. There are other ways to do this as well. But this idea of elevation, making sure you find that common ground, is very transformative in order to be effective as a designer or a professional in any setting. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And it doesn't make sense to see people who are working next to you as your enemies. Yeah, you hopefully have the same purpose, same goals. And uh, when you're struggling in conversations, it's probably not because of the sh uh, shared goal, but it's because of operations, practicalities, tacticals, uh, stuff like that. Or yeah. simply a limited perspective, Yeah. right? Yeah. In order, like, you might not know what those other person is going through as well. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I think that's a great uh, sort of thing to wrap up on. Uh, wrap up on. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your perspective coming in uh, from the design ops community. I really think that the service design community can benefit a lot from what's happening there, knowing a bit more, uh, creating a bit more awareness. Uh, this was a great conversation uh, about design principles and how they can help to make better decisions faster. I think <laughs> we'll let the listeners decide, but uh, I feel uh, you managed to definitely deliver upon that promise and uh, show the potential there. So thanks again for coming on and sharing this with uh, with the Service Design Show community. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me. I, I really hope I was able to add uh, a tiny bit of value to maybe one person. Uh, that's all I, I hope to achieve. And, and yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really hope that you enjoyed the conversation with Wolfram as much as I did and that you got something useful out of it. If you haven't done so yet, make sure to click that subscribe button so you won't miss any of the future episodes. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.